these are these next two lectures are great. Well, okay, so <clears throat> I got good news and then I got more good news. Ready? Good news is relativity's done. I don't know if that's good news or bad news. Probably good news for a lot of you because uh, it wasn't exactly the easiest thing that we did in this class. <laughs> um, the next couple lectures are really exciting stuff. Uh, what we're doing is we're looking at the development of physics that occurred in the early part of the 20th century. And um, in the early part of the 20th century, there was a, a lot of changes happening in physics and astronomy. A lot of new discoveries and a big shift in the way we thought about both those topics. And um, then this lecture and the lecture we're going to have next Monday <clears throat> is going to go into all the various important discoveries that occurred about 100 years ago that ushered in um, a lot of the modern ideas we have in physics. So it's kind of neat. I mean, I'm going to reference a lot of historical things people and experiments and things like that. And we see how classical physics gets transformed into a lot of the modern ideas we have. So, no, no, this is, um, you know, a lot of the stuff that we're going to be talking about was basically right at the turn of the century until about the mid-1920s. And... There was a lot of really important discoveries made in physics and astronomy. Um, one of the most notable things was the discovery of the electron and the discovery of the um, nucleus of atoms. Those were really big deals. In fact, one of those really important discoveries, at least as far as astronomy is concerned, is the first thing we're going to talk about here. Um, which is on continuous spectra and black body radiation. Now, if you go back at the turn of the 20th century, right when the 20th century started, you know, 1900s or so, um, there was a very simple question in physics that could not be answered with the physics at the time. A really simple question. And the question was, why do objects glow when they're hot? I mean, it sounds so simple. Why do objects glow when they're hot? And what I mean specifically by that is, what exactly is producing the light that comes from these objects that are glowing due to their temperature? And uh, if you go back, like I said, about 120 years, there really wasn't a sufficient answer to that question. It really could not be answered. And in fact, in order to answer that question, an entirely new branch of physics needed to be developed. And that branch of physics is what today we call quantum mechanics. Understanding the behavior of particles at the atomic level. It's not treating particles at the atomic level from a classical standpoint doesn't work. We have to develop a completely different framework of physics to understand the behavior of, of, of atoms and electrons, all those things. And uh, one of the first ways we see that is in this topic right here. So when we talk about a black body, this is a ideal object that would look black, we call black body, because it would be a perfect absorber of radiation and emitter of radiation. It wouldn't prefer any particular wavelength due to chemical reactions or something like that. And the curves that you see here are what are called black body curves or Planck radiation curves. They're kind of used interchangeably. And you can see the temperatures given here. These are relatively hot temperature. And what you're seeing here is how the intensity of light varies on objects according to wavelength and temperature. 
That's what we're seeing here. Um, so this was difficult to explain initially why this kind of behavior occurs. Um, <clears throat> the initial attempt to explain, because this is, just to be clear about this, um, the curves that you see here, um, at least initially, we can treat these as empirical curves. You know, we look at an object that is very hot, and we look at the distribution of light that's emitted from that object, and we get these kind of curves here. And the behavior of these curves is, you know, at lower wavelengths, there's not a lot of radiation here, but then it shoots up rather quickly, reaches a peak, and then it more gradually tapers off as you get to longer wavelengths. I mean, that was easily seen, not easily explained. The attempt to explain that is what's known as the uh, Raleigh Jeans curve, uh, done by a couple different uh, physicists that attempted to explain, you know, the light that's being emitted by these objects here. And uh, as you can see, that doesn't really fit what the experimental data shows. And at the time, this was called the ultraviolet catastrophe because when you get to ultraviolet wavelengths, which is the wavelengths you get on the left-hand side here, phys physics could not properly explain why um, the data would shoot down instead of shooting up. And this particular formula that you see here, again, was a classical way to at least explain the left-hand side of these curves. Sorry, right-hand side, not left-hand, right-hand side. Couldn't really explain the other side. Um, that all changed when Max, 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 Planck um, utilized different methods in classical physics to represent this curve. And as you can see, was able to fit perfectly um, the distribution of light that comes from objects that are very hot. And the difference that occurred is in recognizing that the energy transitions that occur inside the atoms followed quantized state of energy. In the Raleigh genes uh, explanation, any energies were allowed. Any possible transitions of energy were allowed, whereas in the Planck interpretation, energy came in packets that were, were multiples of a particular number. And when you quantize or create sort of discrete distributions of energy, the behavior looks very, very different. And so this insane looking function here, which it really is, it's absolutely bizarre function, um, is the curve that represents, you know, that was able to, you know, model the empirical data. This is a function, well, let me put it this way. This is a kind of a multi-dimensional function. Um, if you choose a particular temperature, this becomes a plot of intensity versus wavelength. So there's kind of a couple variables here. So imagine we can insert a temperature and then we can come up with a curve that follows a function by wavelength. But it's very wild. Um, it has a wavelength to the fifth power, which is absolutely insane. I mean, fifth power is, I mean, I, don't, I can't even comprehend why a fifth power is in here. And then it has this other constant in here called H, which is the uh, Planck constant. <clears throat> I will get to that a little bit later, but it, it's involved in the idea of quantized energy here. So this was able to accurately predict the intensity of light that objects emit when they're hot. And so this was in very important in astronomy because this explained exactly the radiation profile of stars. You know, you know, given a, a, a given a temperature for a star, can you predict the kind of radiation it emits? Well, these curves do that. So that was interesting. Now, um, actually, let me go back a little bit and just highlight something here before I get into the laws. Um, <clears throat> these are Planck curves of different temperatures. And you will notice a couple different features to these curves. 
Um, the first feature is as the objects get hotter, the intensity of light increases. So as you can see, as we get to hotter and hotter objects, the peaks right, get higher overall. I mean, not just the peaks, but every possible wavelength is at a higher intensity. And the other feature that we see here is as the temperature goes up, the particular peak in the black body spectrum uh, shifts to shorter wavelengths. And those are two general laws of thermal radiation. The first of which is referred to as Wien's law. Wien's law is the, um, re is the statement about as temperatures increase, peak wavelengths shift to shorter wavelengths. And the equation here is the peak wavelength times the temperature equals a constant. So if you actually think about this as divided by temperature, there's an inverse relationship between wavelength and temperature. And so as temperature goes up, the wavelength goes down. That is a, that's what we call Wien's law for the black body curves. And this is a very simple, somewhat crude uh, way to determine the temperature of an object is you observe a hot object, you look at the distribution of light through a spectrometer or something, and you find the peak wavelength and you can use this equation to determine what the temperature of that object is, assuming that it obeys a you know roughly black body spectrum. It may not because in the reality, most things have absorption lines, emission lines, things like that. All right. Um, by the way, the way we get that, just if you're curious, is you take this a function here and you take the derivative of it and set it equal to zero because the peak is a local maximum. And so if you take the derivative of this with respect to wavelength and solve, set equal to zero and solve for wavelength, you get this relationship right here. Uh, good luck taking the derivative of this. It's a little complicated as you might see, <laughs> but you do end up with this nice relationship here. Now, the other part of this is taking the integral of this really insane function here. Level of calculus is going to start going up quite a bit. And uh, by the time we get into quantum, you're going to be uh, just in tears 24-7. I'll just say that, you know. All right. So the other side of this is if we want to know what the entire intensity of light is, because the Planck curve tells of the intensity of light by wavelength. What if you want to know the overall intensity of light? That's what we call luminosity. Well, what you do is you integrate the Planck curve. As you can see from the the pictures I showed you before, they have a finite area under the curve, so you can evaluate these integrals. And if you can believe the integral uh, of that insane function uh, over wavelengths for a given temperature, is this expression right here. It's a 2 pi to the fifth power. Like, what the... Pi to the fifth power is insane. Bolt's being constant to the fourth power. Planck's constant to the third power. Speed of light squared. Temperature to the fourth. Anyway, all the stuff is that's the coefficient here can all be summarized <clears throat> into a single constant. It's called the Stefan Boltzmann constant. And it's 5.76 times 10 to the minus 8 watts per square meter per Kelvin to the fourth power. And what this equation tells you is when you put in the temperature here, you get a measure of how much light is emitted per square meter on the object. So this is not exactly, I said luminosity, it's not entirely luminosity. This simply tells you the amount of light in the form of watts, joules per second, over a, over a given um, square meter of surface. Now, if you want to multiply this sigma temperature to the fourth power by the surface area of your object, you would get 
the luminosity, which is the overall energy output of the object. If this replies to stars, then you could multiply the sigma temperature to the fourth by four pi radius squared, which is the surface area of a sphere. And what that gives you is it gives you the luminosity of the star. You get how, how much energy is released per second from the star. So anyway, these two laws are very important. They're derived from calculus on this insane relationship here. But they have very important conceptual meanings, and obviously you can do things with them mathematically. So question for you here. In fact, I have to step away for about 30 seconds. Uh, so read over this question, put a letter in the chat. I'll be right back really, really super quick. All right, so what you got to say here? D's, 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 D's. D looks good. I like D because the Stefan Boltzmann law is temperature to the fourth power. So if you are going double a temperature, you would expect the amount of energy released to go up by a fact 16. Sorry, yeah. Not by four. No, it's two to the fourth power. Sorry. I'm a little out of my mind right now. Okay, yeah. Two to the fourth power, that's 16, goes up by a factor of 16. Excellent. Okay, fantastic. All right. Close that out. Um, you didn't see that. So the brass plate, a brass plate at room temperature, 300 Kelvin, radiates 100 watts of energy. If its temperature was increased to 600 Kelvin, the wavelength of maximum intensity, this is Wien's law, what happens to that wavelength? A lot of Bs. Bs good. Inverse relationship. If you increase the temperature of an object, the peak wavelength that's emitted goes to shorter wavelengths. Very good. Okay, let's do a problem. Let's get right into a problem. Okay, so a two centimeter diameter metal sphere is glowing red, but a spectrum shows that its, emit, its emission spectrum peaks at an infrared wavelength of two microns. So the fact that it's glowing red means that it you know, I mean, here's the thing about thermal radiation. Light is being emitted at all wavelengths. You know, not equally, though. Uh, there is a peak. But if you peak in the infrared, you still have what we call a red slope in the visual spectrum where there's more red light being emitted than blue light. So while an object may look red, it doesn't mean it peaks in the visual spectrum. And you can see this, for example, in... If you have an electric stove, for example, an electric stove, when you turn it up real high, you know, the coils get, the coil on that stove starts to glow orangish red. Uh, that doesn't mean that it's peaking at orange red. It means it's, I mean, if you think about the temperatures, the temperatures aren't above like a thousand Fahrenheit or anything like that. So, um, it may peak in the in the uh, infrared, but there's still enough light in the visual spectrum to see it. Anyway, we know this object peaks at two microns. Great. How much power does the sphere radiate? Assume that the metal sphere acts as a black body. All right. So, in order to know how much power the sphere radiates, we're going to have to first figure out how hot it is. We use Wien's law for that. 2.9 times 10 to the 6 nanometers per Kel nanometers Kelvin. That is the form of Wien's law that I like to use in my astronomy class. Just put it in terms of nanometers because nanometers are a very common unit used in this stuff here. So Wien's law, when you want to apply nanometers, is 2.9 times 10 to the 6 nanometers Kelvin. So... Two microns, that's 10 to the 6. Nanometers is 10 to the 9. So this is actually 2,000 nanometers. Divide these numbers, we get 1450 Kelvin. Pretty darn hot. It's really hot. It's like uh, maybe 26 or so, 26, 27,000 Fahrenheit. So with this temperature, we can now go to uh, the 7 Boltzmann law and determine the power per meter squared, per meter squared. 
That's what, because the units for this intensity here is in watts per square meter. So we're going to multiply with the seven Boltzmann constant here by our temperature. And we end up with 2.5 or so times 10 to the fifth watts per square meter. The last step is to multiply this because it's per square meter multiplied by the number of square meters that we have. Well, it's a two centimeter diameter metal sphere. So we want to turn that into, I mean, I want to turn that into a radius and then use four pi r squared as the surface area of the sphere. And if I multiply that by this number here, I can see that we get um, 310 watts. So at this temperature for a two centimeter diameter sphere, it's a midden, 310 watts. All right, great. Why do I have this thing down here? What is this? That is, that's a, that's a different, that's a different topic. I don't know what I was doing that particular day, <clears throat> but all right. So that closes up the continuous spectrum stuff. Now what we're going to get into is you're going to get into uh, an effect that demonstrates some of the particle properties of light. And uh, it's based on a very interesting observation. So as you can see in the figure here, what we have is we have a battery um, hooked up to this apparatus here that has metal plates separated by a distance, almost like a capacitor. And what happens here is we shine light onto the cathode. And what we find is if the light is of a particular frequency or wavelength, then a current is gonna be recorded in this circuit here. Um, you know, without shining light on this, this is not a complete circuit. There's, there gonna, there's gonna be no current that's recorded here. But when light is sh uh, shown, shine, shown, 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 shined. When we shine light, I'll just say that because that makes sense to me. When we shine light on this cathode here, I, my skills are math and physics. My, 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 my eight-year-old son came to me today and he's like, Dad, does happy have a long E or a short E? And I was like, hold on, let me refer to Google. And he's like, how do you not know that? And I'm like, well, you're asking me this question, first of all. And second of all, I'm not an English guy. So apparently it has a long E. <laughs> Happy E, long E, and whatever. Okay, so photo E let trick. Wait, hold on. Photo E let? That has two different E's in it. What about effect? E effect. <gasps> effect. Effect. Wow, mind blown. Anyway, okay, got two different E's going on here in these things. All right, back to the math and physics. The light shines on the cathode. If the light is of a particular energy or frequency or wavelength, how you want to view it, it completes the circuit somehow. If there's no light, you don't have a complete circuit, but when you shine light on it, you can complete the circuit. That's weird. That's weird because, you know, the idea behind, you know, Circuits here is, if current's flowing, it's because there's electrons flying around this thing. So somehow the introduction of light here allows that to occur. This is what we collectively refer to as the photoelectric effect. Um, that the addition of light here can actually cause the creation of current. Now, there's no classical explanation for this phenomenon. It's a very strange phenomenon. So let's look a little more closely at what's going on here. Now, the way this works is you can shine light on this cathode here. And um, if the frequency is too low, nothing happens. It's not a complete circuit. But suddenly when you reach a particular threshold 
fourth frequency, then just magically, it's not magic, but magically, the current just appears. Uh, it's true if you up the frequency of light, there's a little reduction in current. But the main focus here is that below this frequency, there's nothing. And above the frequency, you just boom, automatically there's a current going on there. So, and this particular threshold frequency is material dependent. Different metals have different threshold frequencies to them. Cool. Furthermore, um, if you do this, and, you know, because physicists are sort of mad scientists and they do crazy things with their experiments, well, some people had the idea to flip the battery around and see if they can somehow change the current. And it, yeah, it turns out if you flip the battery around, so you're trying to drive current in the opposite direction, you will actually reduce the current in that circuit. Now, this is the light is still shining here up to a point. Uh, there is a particular potential that's reached called the stopping potential where you completely kill current. You don't allow any current to flow. So, and the intensity of the light that you shine doesn't really change that kind of behavior. It just kind of determines um, how much current flows. If you have a really intense light, you can get a lot of current to flow. In a weaker light, you know, a little less, that's all. So, the interpretation is that threshold frequency represents a minimum amount of energy that is required to allow the current to continue to flow. We call this the work function given by E naught here. And there are different work functions for different elements here. These are the different initial energies of the photons that come in contact with the metal. As you can see here, potassium and sodium are very low, meaning it doesn't take a huge amount of energetic light. Now, I would, shouldn't say that, that's a bad phrase. The um, energy of the light doesn't need to be very high in order to get this effect to occur. But as you start to go up, uh, down this list here, I should say, when you get down to say gold, for example, gold is very difficult to get this to do. So what's going on here? Well, here's how this works. When the light is incident on the cathode, it comes in contact with electrons and it supplies the electrons energy. And if the energy is of a certain, certain threshold, that's the threshold frequency, you can actually dislodge the electrons from the atoms they're present in they get removed and as they're removed, any excess energy that the photon had compared to their you know, work function here allows them to have a kinetic energy that can help them hit the anode and therefore complete the circuit to some extent. So the energy needs to, of the light needs to be relatively high for this to happen. You have to first dislodge an electron that's why you have a threshold frequency. There's a certain amount of energy required to bounce the electrons out of their atoms. And then any residual energy is turned into kinetic energy, and then they could possibly hit the anode. And therefore you will have some current that is seen. Well, if you hook this up to the battery, then these anode and the cathode and the anode sort of represents like a capacitor. And when the electrons get this large, this lodged, um, they will accelerate in the electric field that's present here, that's established by the battery, and they will accelerate towards the anode and hit it. So with the battery there, by the way, this is just, there's no battery, just, just shine light. If you just shine light on the element here, on the elements here, the cathode, you get some signal on the anode. But when you hook this up to a battery, now when the electrons get dislodged, you can accelerate them through a potential difference. 
and a lot more of them are going to hit the anode. And you're going to see a greater current. For every electron that hits the anode, you see a bigger current. You know, So that's what happens here. Now, flipping the battery around, what that does is it discourages the electrons from hitting the anode. You know, the light comes in, hits an electron, dislodges it, and it tries to shoot towards the side here. But when you flip the polarity of the battery, uh, the anode now repels the electrons and you deflect them. And so much less will hit. And in fact, you can get up to a certain value of potential, which is what we call the Sopin potential, where there's enough energy to make any electron uh, come to a stop and turn around. So nothing hits the anode and there's no current anymore. So this is a pretty, pretty wild setup here. Let's put numbers behind this. That's the next thing we gotta put numbers behind this stuff. So uh, at the moment here, we're shining a light onto the cathode, the electrode's gonna jump off and they're gonna accelerate across this. Now, when, they, when the photons hit, any, like I said, any residual energy is, is, is in the form of kinetic energy that can allow the electrons to come and hit the anode. So initially they have no potential energy. They may have some kinetic. Um, afterwards, um, they're going to be accelerated through a potential difference that's established between the, the cathode and the anode. And their um, kinetic energy will increase because they'll speed up. And the potential energy will go down to some extent. Yeah, you know, I, I said zero. We have a zero point right here, but zero points don't mean anything really for potential energy. It's just about changes. So the potential energy still drops here as the kinetic energy increases. And so we can create this nice expression here. It's just an energy conservation expression. There's some initial kinetic energy. And then the electrons are put through a potential difference that will result in a higher you know, kinetic energy here. However, when you flip the battery around, you can cause these electrons with whatever potential, with whatever kinetic energy they have to slow down and come to a stop. And as a result, they will not hit the anode. Well, that will occur if your kinetic energy is, uh, your final kinetic energy is zero. And if you solve for delta V here, the potential, you get what the stop in potential is. It's the potential, it's the maximum kinetic energy that the electrons can have divided by their charge. That's just said in KF, the final kinetic energy equals zero, solving for delta V. All right, so we're kind of all over the place at the moment. Let me give you a few questions We'll do some problems that we'll kind of, I'll pull this together here. Question for you now is, in this experiment, a current is detected when ultraviolet light shines on the metal cathode, just like we've been talking about. What happens to the current if the battery voltage is reduced to zero? So what happens at the moment is when the light comes and hits the cathode, the electrons can be dislodged they're accelerated and they hit the anode. But what if the battery was, was disconnected? A lot of B's and A's, a lot of B's and A's. All right, now let's go through all the expressions here. What does the battery do exactly? The battery establishes the potential difference between the cathode and the anode, which when any electrons get discharged, they're going to want to accelerate through the potential difference and hit the anode. So the battery encourages the electrons to hit the anode. So we would definitely expect the current to be somewhat strong here, but when you remove the battery, you're not encouraging electrons to hit the anode. What happens is that when the electrons get dislodged here, we just hope they hit the anode. I mean, when the light comes incident to the cathode here, the electrons are dislodged they can go pretty much any direction they want to. Some hit the anode, but if the potential difference is there, you're encouraging more to hit it. So if you disconnect the battery, 
we would definitely expect the current to drop. Now, slightly decrease is definitely a subjective term here. It really depends on a lot of factors. But A is wrong because the battery potential encourages the collision of electrons. So by removing that, definitely the current's going to change. It doesn't become zero, as part C, as option C suggests, because some electrons naturally will dislodge and hit the anode. And then D is just, I don't know what to say about D. It's just wrong. Just very wrong. So the answer is B. That's correct. Okay. So what is going on here? Let's start to put some sense behind this stuff. So in 1900 or so, Max Planck was able to, you know, discuss the merits of uh, using quantized energies to understand black body radiation. And he found that the energy of the photons involved had to be these discrete values that were basically multiples of this constant H that we refer to now as Planck's constant. My goodness, my phone needs to just shut up. Sorry. Let me make sure my phone is going to shut up. Yes. No, no vibrations, no nothing. Off, off, off. My goodness. All right, so this number is now what we call Planck's constant. 6.63 times 10 to the minus 34. That's an incredibly small number. Joule seconds. And this was an important thing for Max Planck's uh, black body radiation that the energies involved had to be these discrete values. And if you made that assumption, then you were able to fit the, uh, the radiation curves. Well, a few years later, Einstein um, made the suggestion that it's light, it's the electromagnetic radiation that comes in these quantized packets. And each packet is what we call a light quantum. We have a term for that today. We call that photons. So photons are these packets of light with finite energy to them. And the energy of these packets of light is given by Planck's constant times the frequency of the light. Um, this is important to explain the black body radiation. And it's also crucial to understanding why the photoelectric effect occurs. Um, so let's, now, this relationship right here, E equals HF, is going to be a fundamental equation that will take us through the rest of the class. This was a major, major breakthrough in physics. The recognition that not only electromagnetic radiation has energy, but that uh, it comes in these packets, and each packet is H times F, where F is the frequency of that light. Let's just apply a real simple relationship there. What is this? I have an example here. Did I miss this example? What the heck? Hold on. Let me go back here. Did I just skip over a slide, or is, or is my notes out of order here? Um, what's going on here? Okay, no, I don't have it. Okay, I just, my example two is just missing? What? What's going on here? I don't know. I'm skipping it, apparently. Didn't realize that was the case here. All right, the retina of your eye has three types of color photoreceptors called cones with maximum sensitivities that... The following wavelengths. For each, what is the energy of one quantum of light at these wavelengths? Well, straightforward thing. E equals HF, but we want this in terms of wavelength, so we're going to use the relationship that wavelength and frequency uh, equals the speed of light. So we can also write this as HC over lambda. And so for each of these, we're going to do this in terms of lambda, 
And uh, I put in my Planck constant, speed of light, divided by the wavelength in nanometers. Now, as you can see here for the first one, I put this in terms of joules, because that's what you would get if you put in SI units for these things. But I also wanted to convert it to electron volts. And I briefly mentioned electron volts in the last lecture, but what you do is you would divide your energies by 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19 joules. That's what one electron volt is. 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19 joules. And we have this now in terms of electron volts. So as the wavelengths go up, the electron volts are gonna go down. There's an inverse relationship, as you can see here, between wavelength and energy. Great. Okay. In fact, uh, this was a very profound discovery that was made. And in fact, it got Einstein the Nobel Prize for the photoelectric effect. In fact, as insane as this may sound, he did not receive a Nobel Prize for relativity. Um, he actually received the Nobel Prize for, I think, I think he received the Nobel Prize for a couple things, actually. And... You know, it escapes me right now what he got. I think it was, yeah, I think I, my recollection is he got two. I think he got two. What? I only got one? He got robbed. Photoelectric effect, not for brownie motion. I thought he got it for brownie motion. Come on. What? Have I lost my mind? Maybe I did. Hmm. I thought he got it for brownie motion. Well, maybe there's a rule you can only get one. I don't know. Seven? You should have got seven, according to this article. My goodness. Okay, I don't know the rules. I don't know the rules. Maybe they only give one. I have no idea. I don't, I actually don't even know. Anyway, so, um, yes, we call them photons now. And they're very important sort of postulates that Einstein put forward to uh, explain this effect here. Um, light comes in these packets. Um, in that sense, they're like particles. It, there's a packet of energy. You can count a single photon. And a single photon can be described with a frequency, but to individualize that photon, we can talk about the energy contained in that one photon. And that's given by E equals HF, frequency. Um, Photon energy cannot be um, dissected in any way. If the photon is to impart energy, it's an all or nothing scenario. So the way we see this, for example, is when you shine light on, say, a cool gas, there are certain wavelengths that get absorbed in that light, and those are complete absorption of photons that allow electrons in the elements that make up the gas to jump to higher levels. But it's not like you can absorb some of the photon energy and then the remaining energy just becomes a lower energy photon. That's not how it works. Photons are emitted or absorbed altogether. <clears throat> so, all right. So in the example here, a photon of a particular energy comes in and the electrons that exist in the element, in the metal here, well, they have a particular sort of binding energy, you could say, um, or ionization energy is actually a better word for that, where if they receive a certain threshold of energy, that can be enough to completely dislodge them from their nuclei. That's why we see that there's a threshold frequency because the light needs to be energetic enough so that all of the photon's energy 
can be absorbed by the electron and then it becomes free from the metal. And any excess energy is now the kinetic energy of that. So if we talk about a particular threshold frequency that exists because there is a, um, a well, I mean, the relationship here is the threshold energy is related to the work function of the metal. And so there is a simple relationship here between the two that's based on how we are describing photons and the energy that they have. So now more intense light used is not going to somehow change um, the, the, that work function. All that does is it produces, you know, more photons. So that means more electrons can be made and you can drive the current up to some extent because of that. But it, light intensity is not necessarily about energy, it's about numbers. So more numbers, more electrons, you can have a higher current here. So if you lower the energy of the light, meaning you lower that frequency, it doesn't matter what the intensity of light is. Either it's the right energy or higher or it's not. Intensity does not matter. But once you do reach that threshold for energy, intensity can play a role and at least drive in some extra current. That's the idea. Okay. So let's look at what the kinetic energy of these particles are. Now this relationship here is saying, okay, E electric here is what the energy of the electron is after it's dis well it's the energy the electron has when it absorbs the photons now subtract from that the work energy of the metal because you need that energy just to be freed from that and then any residual energy which is what the subtraction is here turns into kinetic energy well, the electron is going to have energy that matches what the photon was that hit it. So we're going to put HF here for that. And then we recognized earlier that the kinetic energy is related to the stopping potential because the stopping potential is what the potential is needed to bring things to a halt so that there's no more current. So we're basically equating the kinetic energy of the electrons by the potential energy that's established by the battery. When those match, the electrons come to a stop, right? So we can replace here, divide everything by E, we get a measure of stopping potential, which is again related to the photon energy, the work function divided by what the electron thing is here. So each element, each uh, metal, you can say here, has a different stop in potential uh, based on what the work function is. Okay, and you can see here why there's a threshold energy because you have to have this positive. If you don't, then you can't establish a stop in potential because there's no current going on here. All right, so um, let me think here. How are we going to do this? Well, if we express this work function here, as a sort of minimum frequency, you can replace this with H times F naught, which is the minimum frequency. And you can actually create this linear relationship here between the frequency of the light and the stopping potential. And there's a couple interesting things about this relationship. Just from an experimental standpoint, the slope of this line would represent H over E. So it can give you a measure of the Planck constant, which by the way, when there's not a pandemic, as we do this in the lab, but there is a pandemic, so we're not. Um, and then the intercept here is gonna tell you what that uh, threshold frequency is. So that's neat. Okay, question for you here, and I think we'll take a break because we're, we're approaching an hour now, but think about this question here. All right, if you increase the intensity of the light but keep the color of the same, if you increase the intensity of the light but keep the color of the light the same, now when we say color, we mean wavelength or frequency. 
their electrons emitted per second will do what, and the maximum energy will do what. All right, what do you think? Let them in the chat. A lot of A's. A's, huh? Hmm. Increase the intensity of light, but keep the color of the light the same. No electrons emitted per second. Well, that's true. I don't know about the second part, though. Yeah, it's a problem. So the intensity of the light means more photons, which means more electrons are dislodged. That makes sense. But I don't know if I like the second set. The maximum kinetic energy of the emitted electrons will. Well, intensity of light is not necessarily related to the energy involved, right? Um, it stays the same because you have to not change the intensity. We have to change the color of the light. So um, if you were to say pick light that is of a shorter wavelength and therefore higher energy, there's more residual energy involved. So you can kick the electrons out, but now they have more kinetic energy. So if you're not changing the color of the light, you're not changing the maximum kinetic energy, basically. All right, so uh, we have another question here, but we are uh, at least halfway through, so I do want us to take a break here. Let's do 10 minutes. We have a little bit more on photoelectric effect, then we're going to jump into a slightly different topic. So let's have, okay, we're going to increase the cathode's work function. So it's like we swapped out the metal. We put another one in there. And what that means is the threshold frequency is increased. So it becomes... Uh, What you're doing is by increasing the threshold frequency, you need a more energetic photon to dislodge the electrons. And the maximum kinetic energy is going to go down now. So the maximum kinetic energy goes down. Well, that was involved in the stopping potential. All right. So what we have here is the stopping potential goes down. So again, the logic here is greater work function, um, lesser kinetic energy if you can dislodge the electrons. Lesser kinetic energy means you need a lesser stopping potential to get those electrons to turn around and not hit the anode there. So electrons emerge slower, so stopping potential is reduced. That's good. Now, it's not going to change the current. Once you can dislodge them, they'll hit the anode. So the current's not going to be altered there. Now, if you change the intensity of light, okay, that's different. We're not talking about that, though. So that's why A and C are particularly um, not of interest here because they have reduced intensities. Sorry, reduced currents, which would come from reduced intensities. But there's no indication that we're do actually doing something like that. Okay, great. So what happens to this graph by the photoelectric current if the cathode's work function is larger than the photon energy? So we're swapping out the cathode for something that has a work function that is greater than photon energy. Well, we got one person saying A, but it's C. So if your work function is larger than photon energy, that means you've not reached threshold of frequency. And the photons are not enough to dislodge electrons. So nothing happens at all. You need to have the photons up to that frequency. Otherwise, nothing happens. All right, what are the threshold frequencies and wavelengths for photo emission from sodium and aluminum? Well, you got to know what their work functions are, so let's go look at that. Uh, according to the table that I had earlier, the work function for sodium and aluminum are the following here. And if we want to figure out what those frequencies are, well, we just substitute these um, equations, uh, sorry, these uh, energies here into the expression for the threshold frequency. Now, I had previously showed you a value for the Planck constant to be 6.63 times 10 to the minus 34 joule seconds. But if you divide that 
by um, the energy in an electron volt, 1.6 to the minus 19, we now have an alternative expression here for the Planck constant in terms of electron volts instead of joules. 4.14 times 7 to the minus 15 electron volt seconds. So there are two versions, you could say, sort of, of the Planck constant, one in joules and one in electron volts. And the relationship between them is you can divide the first one, the 6.63, by the 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19, and then we get this one here. So we get our frequencies by dividing just by that Planck constant, and then we uh, have speed of light over frequency is what our wavelengths are, so these are the wavelengths here. So for sodium, your the wavelength of light has got to be at least be 452 or lower for the wavelength. For aluminum, you have to have a 290 nanometer photon or lower, um, which is, you know, this is already ultraviolet light. So you need pretty energetic photons to this large electrons. Sodium, not so much. It makes sense, though. Sodium is, you know, on the left side of the periodic table, the valence electron is not too tightly bound. It's a little easier to dislodge than for something like aluminum. Okay, that's the interpretation there. Okay, another question for you, because there's a lot of concept here in the photoelectric effect. That's why I'm throwing you a lot of questions here. What happens to this graph of the current if the cathode's work function is slightly decreased. So what's the relationship with wavelength now? What do you think's happening there? A lot of people saying B, but um, I don't think it's B. Let's talk about it. If the work function is increased, you will need more energy. So your frequency should be higher and your wavelength will be lower. That's why the answer is C here. Okay, so there's a direct relationship between work function and frequency, higher frequency, higher photon energy. The work, fun work function represents the minimum energy needed to dislodge. So if you increase that, you need more energetic photons. In terms of wavelength, that means a shorter wavelength. Okay, and again, a would be wrong here because the current not really being affected here. You affect current by intensity when it changes intensity. And uh, so B, though, is wrong. Increase wavelength here. So that would be true if it was decreased, the work function. All right. I think I got a couple more examples here, and then we'll get into a different topic. Let's do it. All right, for a particular cathode material in a photoelectric experiment, you measure the stop potentials to be one volt for 650 nanometers, two volts for 400, and three volts for 300. Okay, so what's happening here is this. We are decreasing the wavelength of the light. So that means uh, the energy of the light goes up, that means the photons have more kinetic energy when they're dislodged. So you're going to need a greater potential to get the electrons to not produce the current. That's the idea. So we have our equation for stop and potential here. And I'm going to rewrite this. So I said we want to determine the work function for this material and the implied value for the Planck constant. So I'm actually going to take the equation that we developed previously for the stop and potential. And I'm going to write it in terms of a linear function. So the variable here is the frequency. The slope of this line should be h over e, and the intercept is going to help us determine what the work function is. So, um, you know, for the intercept here, um, well, let's see here. I'm going to take these values that we have here because <clears throat> we're going to create a graph here, as you can see, 
that's going to be frequency. Uh, well, it's going to be stop potential versus frequency. So I have some values I could plot here. So for these different stop potentials, one, two, and three, I have wavelengths here, which I'm going to convert to frequencies. And it allows me to create these two points on here. Okay. Once I got these two points, by the way, this is not the only way to solve this problem. It's just an interesting way to solve the problem. Just, just to be clear about this, you don't have to do it this way to do this problem. I just thought I was interested to do it in this manner here because I've kind of been showing a lot of graphs so far. But these three points can establish a linear line. And when you fit this line, we get a slope of 0.4 and we get an intercept of minus 1V. So minus 1 volts, by the way, minus 1 represents the intercept. So I put minus 1 in here and I solve for, um, for the stopping potential and I get 1 electron volt. So the work function is 1 electron volt. Doesn't require a ton of energy. It's pretty low value, actually. The slope is 0.4 here. Now I put this in units of uh, 10 to the 14. It's kind of hard to see here. But this is in units of 10 to the 14. So I set my slope equal to h over e. And if I accept, you know, just put in the value I have for e in the fundamental charge, we end up with a value of 6.4 times 10 to the minus 34, which is pretty close. Obviously, we'd want more precise values. These are probably not precise wavelengths here. That's why we don't have exactly 6.63 or whatever. That's a way to approach the problem, definitely. Um, I mean, you could, uh, you could just use these values and manipulate the equations. You know, you can get the slope by doing a, doing a slope on, of these values here and, and then uh, doing a similar thing with the equation as a function. I didn't need to plot anything, just to be clear. But if you did, it's one way to do it. So that's kind of interesting. All right. Uh, I think I have another question immediately. Let me zoom out a bit here. While conducting a photoelectric effect experiment with light of a certain frequency, you find that a reverse in, that a reverse potential difference of 1.25 is required to reduce the current to zero. So that's the stop in potential. We want to find the maximum kinetic energy and the maximum speed of the emitted uh, photoelectrons. Okay, well, the stop potential is related to the maximum kinetic energy by max kinetic energy over E. So solve for that, we get one point. Uh, we get two times ten to the minus nineteen, which is, I mean, it would be the same thing would be one point two five electron volts because the e is here. Uh, we set that equal to one half mv squared. Uh, we'll assume we're not relativistic here, but we'll find out in a minute. Uh, if I set this equal to one half mv squared, and I use the mass of an electron, we get a velocity at six point six three times ten to the fifth meters per second, which is fine because that is <clears throat> less than 1% of the speed of light. So it wouldn't be necessary to make a relativistic correction, but it would be pretty cool to include that, but it's just we don't need to do that here. All right. So I got... All right. So let's move on from this. Let's start talking about some other topics related to this. Uh, we want to get into, now what we've been hinting at here is this particle-like behavior to photons. We now know that photons can impart energy and dislodge electrons and cause them to have a kinetic energy. That's definitely particle-like properties to them. <coughs> so that being said, we should be able to develop some similar expressions for photons as they relate to particles. Well, I talked about this in the last lecture where photons have no rest mass. So another way to specify the energy of a photon is by to take that equation we developed in the last lecture and have the rest mass be zero. And we find that the energy is equal to P times C, where P is the momentum of, of that photon. Well, solving for that, we get E over C for the photon momentum. Uh, the energies can be given as H times F, and then we can take the F over C and convert it to a wavelength. So we have this really nice relationship here that is an inverse relationship between the wavelength of light and the momentum 
of the photon. And the proportionality constant is given by Planck's constant here. So let's do a problem right off the bat now. All right, laser pointer has a power of 5 milliwatts. Emits a red light 650 nanometers. What is the magnitude of the momentum of each photon? So we have our relationship here. We have wavelength, so I'm going to go with h over lambda for that. If I put an h over lambda, if I'm going to do this in the, in the units of joules here, I get 1.02 times 10 to the minus 27. Very small momentum. It's a single photon, you know. Um, how many photons does the laser pointer emit per second, though? If it's 5 milliwatts of energy, well, what I would do is just simply take that power and say, okay, well, each photon has a particular energy to it, and I just multiply that by the number of photons, right? So for the expression for E, I'm going to choose hc over lambda because I have a wavelength here. Solve for n. And I put in my values, make sure everything is SI here. And I get 1.63 times 10 to the 16th photons per second. So for 5 milliwatts of energy, yeah, you're going to need a lot of photons per second. It's not a ton of photons, but um, just recognizing that each photon is a small packet of energy. You can simply say that the, uh, the number of photons is just a multiple of one photon's energy. So that's how we're doing that here. <clears throat> All right. <clears throat> so what about really energetic photons? Really energetic photons. X-rays, for example. Uh, here is a, a real simple way that you can generate X-rays uh, through uh, heating up elements. Now, for example, if you... Uh, you go to the dentist and they take x-rays of your teeth. This is typically how those x-rays are generated. You have a power supply here that heats up a piece of metal. And if you sufficiently heat that metal there, then the energy required to dislodge the electrons uh, will, will be well surpassed. And then you have residual kinetic energy, right? Well, if you heat up the cathode to a high enough extent, you can dislodge these electrons, you can get them to accelerate through an electric potential, and then get them to get to extremely high energies. They collide with the anode, and what that does, and we saw this in the last lecture, the collision of these high energy particles will take that mass and convert it into an energy. You're basically stopping these electrons by hitting the anode. And the residual energy is in the form of a photon. And again, if the potential is high enough, the energies that get created here are enough to produce high energy photons. For example, x-rays. And this is a very common way to generate x-rays by heating up an element accelerating electrons to an extremely high speed so that when they collide, the energy, their mass is converted into an energy, into like an X-ray or something like that. So <clears throat> uh, with the X-ray production, these curves look a lot like Planck curves because in, to a large extent they are. We're converting mass into energy here. And so as you can see, as you increase um, the intensity, you are obviously increasing the energy of the photons that come out, and their peaks shift to shorter wavelengths, actually. So these are really high energy photons. Their kilovolts are very high. Uh, the wavelengths here are very small, picometers. So that's an enormous amount of energy. These are all consistent with x-rays. All right, so if you increase the voltage used to accelerate the electrons... The X-ray photon energy will do what? And the X-ray photon wavelength will what? Let me see what you think about that. We're increasing the voltage. They're more, that means we're accelerating the electrons to a higher speed. So the resultant X-rays are going to do what? What do you think here? A lot of people saying B. I like B. So increased voltage 
means there's going to be a greater electric field. It means you're going to accelerate the electrons to a higher speed. When they collide, the resultant energy will be higher. And there's an inverse relationship between energy and wavelength. So we expect the wavelength to be smaller. Fantastic. Let's do a problem. Okay, so we have electrons in the X-ray tube accelerate through a potential difference of 10 kilovolts, insanely high. If an electron produces one photon and impact with the target, what was the minimum wavelength of the resultant X-rays? Okay. Find the answer. Okay, so this is actually, uh, in physics, the concept of um, having electrons be produced Passing through a potential difference and, and producing X-rays is uh, a phenomenon in physics known as Bremsstrahlung. Bremsstrahlung is a German phrase, and it's the it's basically the creation of X-rays through high energy things here. So the potential difference is going to give be given by E delta V. That is the potential difference, which means. If the electrons go through a drop in potential of 10,000 kilovolts, they will increase in their kinetic energy by that much. So increase in kinetic energy can be equated directly to the photon energy, which is given by H times F. I'll put that in terms of lambda because we want lambda here. So solving for lambda gives us HC over EV. Put in all your numbers for that. we got the point constant in terms of joules. Got speed of light, fundamental charge, and 10,000 for the voltage here. These all should be delta Vs, by the way. I'm being a little sloppy with my notation. But that results in a minimum wavelength of 1.24 nanometers. 1.24 nanometers. Um, by the way, uh, just the other thing about expressing energies in both SI and electron volts. Well, let me box something here for you. The Planck constant divided by E, that is just converting the Planck constant to electron volt units. So combining those two together gives you the pretty much the same expression, just a different value for H here in the appropriate units. So um, this 10,000 volts can produce photons up to 1.124 uh, nanometers. Um, Nothing lower than that because there's not enough energy to do that here. So that's the minimum wavelength. Of course, you can have longer wavelengths if not all of this potential energy was converted to kinetic. It can be converted to other things, right? You don't, it's not everything is converted to kinetic. You'd be, I mean, when you have the collision, you could heat up some of the atoms. Yeah, it's possible. So anyway. <clears throat> Um, what is this here for? I don't remember why I have this here. Oh, hold on, let me read over this again. Eh, it's not important. I don't know, I have this here. All right, I think I have one more topic before we wrap this up. Yeah, I don't know why this is here. What what's, There must be some point I had. I don't even remember what that is now. Hmm. Doesn't it escapes me at the moment why I included this slide? There was some point I had to make, but anyway, it's not important, I guess. All right, the last topic we have here is what's referred to as Compton scattering. Um, this was an important again among the many, many, many relationships we have between energy and mass. What's happening in this experiment? is we have a photon of a particular wavelength and therefore momentum, hits an electron at rest. What happens is the electron scatters away. And surprisingly, the photon is deflected uh, with a reduced amount of energy and therefore a longer wavelength that comes out. Now to conserve momentum here, if the particle is pushed out at an angle, <clears throat> then uh, the angle of the photon will have to be the same because initially there was no x direction momentum. Hold on. 
Hey, there's a little too much noise right now. Hello? 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 What? Sorry, there's just a little too much noise going on right now. I hear like a, a video and then a scraping. Yeah, sorry, it's getting a little noisy in this house. All right, anyway. Oh, whatever. All right, so uh, initially the momentum is all in the x direction. So if there's scattering, the momentum has to be conserved in the y direction. And of course, any residual x momentum is going to be conserved here. Okay. So in Compton scattering, um, after the collision with the photon takes place, part of the energy momentum is imparted um, to the electron here. The electron scatters away, and we can measure the angles uh, that come out of there. And the difference in the wavelength energy can be related to um, you know, basically the, the energy of that electron coming out here. So what we have here is a difference in wavelength between um, the incident photon and what scatters away. Now the scattering photon is going to have a smaller uh, amount of energy, so the wavelength will be larger. So this difference here is always going to be a positive value. Uh, we have the scattering angle here, and then the Planck constant over the over MC here is going to turn this into uh, effectively units of length here. And so this can help predict, once you see the scattering angle, we can predict what kind of scattering radiation is going to come out of here. Okay, so when, and I got a couple questions for you, then we'll do a problem here. When an X-ray photon bounces off an electron, um, what's happening to the photon wavelength and frequency? Let me know what you think about that. All right. Some people said Bs. Some people were saying, sorry, um, there's some Bs, some Cs in there. Um, but the answer is C here. So if the X-ray photon bounces off an electron, uh, we're going to see the wavelength increase because the energy goes down. And, of course, there's an inverse relationship between wavelength and frequency. So um, A and D are just completely inconsistent. You can't have wavelength and frequency both go down. That's not possible. Only B and C make sense. And if the photon bounces off, it's of a lesser energy because it imparts energy to the electron. All right, so let's look at a couple more examples here before we're done. All right, in this example here, we have... Uh, 0.124 nanometer X-ray photons in a Compton scattering experiment. What angle is the wavelength of the scattering X-rays? 1% longer than of the incident X-rays. Okay, so the difference in wavelength is only 1% larger. And we want to know what the angles are for 1% and 0.05%. So you could take that equation we had there and you could rearrange it a bit. The difference in wavelength, as you can see here, um, is given by H over MC, 1 minus cosine phi here. We're just expressing this as lambda phi. And we want a percentage here. So the way we're going to do that is we can divide this equation by lambda, and then the left-hand side becomes a percentage, right? It's the ratio. And so then the other side has a lambda in the denominator. So we can put in 1%, 0 0.01, Solve for the angle here, we get 60.7 degrees. So if the electrons scatter away at 60.7 degrees, then we have changed our wavelength by 1%. That's how much energy is reduced here. Um, having to go down by 0.05, that would be 0.0005, results in a much smaller angle here. So these angles are very easy to measure, these scattering angles here. So that allows us to determine the difference in the wavelengths. All right, the last problem we have here is on pair production, which we talked a bit about 
in the last lecture. So let's go over this. We're kind of combining concepts here. Um, an electron and a positron initially far apart move toward each other with the same speed. They collide head on. That will annihilate them. And they'll produce two photons in the process. We want to find the energies, wavelengths, and frequencies of the photons. If the initial kinetic energy of the electron and the positrons are, um, are either negligible or they're at 5 mega electron volts. Okay, so if the electrons are not moving really too fast. Well, actually, before we do that, let's just get into the energy conservation. I guess it's the first thing. Beforehand, these um, positrons and electrons are going to have an energy that's specified by their kinetic energy plus their rest energy. And then afterwards, two photons are made. So we're going to say that the energy afterwards is equal to 2HF. Okay, so we equate the two together. And if the kinetic energy is very small, we would just ignore it, right? And so we got 2MC squared equals 2HF. The twos drop out. And we want to uh, solve for F here. Is that what we're looking for? Energies, wavelengths, and frequencies. Okay, so the energy is pretty clear. The energy is given by the rest energy, right? Point one, point, sorry, 0 0.511 mega electron volts. To get frequency, that would be E over H. We get a frequency here. And then if we want to get wavelength, we can do C over F for the wavelength there. So that's if the kinetic energy is sufficiently low. Just ignore it. Okay. So that immediately gives us these values here. So as you can see here, if the kinetic energy is extremely low, then the two photons that are made are just going to be basically photons that represent the rest energy of the particles. So 0 0.1, 0 0.511 mega electron volts, both the photons are going to be that. All right. Um, in term, now, what if the uh, kinetic energy was not negligible? What if the kinetic energy was an order of magnitude larger than their rest energies? Then these are now relativistic. Okay, so we set that kinetic energy equal to 5 mega electron volts. So we add this up here. We're going to get 5.511 mega electron volts for our energies. We just simply add the two together. And we do the same process by solving for F and solve for lambda, and as you can see, we have different values based on that. But this is just an energy conservation where we are just identifying that the energy are the combination of rest and kinetic energies, and we equate that directly into photon energy, and we got that.